Can I get a like and subscribe for some DIY awesomeness? That's a thing of beauty right there. Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. We're on something of a DIY odyssey here. During our last episode, we made this dual power supply, two independent circuit battery box. It's going to be used on my new Autopilot 136 from Old Town. And the good news is everything checked out. Uh, I've had this out in the water. I ran it for about two hours. I did not experience any issues with overheating of the battery. Uh, all the connectivity was great. The kayak has an onboard trolling motor. Uh, it also has the capability, if I wanted to, to have a number of different accessories, fish finder, uh, running lights, navigation lights. In our last episode, we made this power pack and we've proven that this works out on the water with the trolling motor. But when it comes to the accessories, you need some kind of a power distribution system. I've decided to try to figure out something for myself. What are some of the reasons why I might want to do that? Well, I've made a list. You know I gotta have a list. No matter what happens, if you're gonna run accessories, you probably have to drill holes in your boat. A lot of folks that are running 136s or 120s, whatever, any kind of sit on hull, there's a propensity to, to keep your power supply inside the body of the boat. If I were going to mount something like the Yak power system, uh, I would probably also have to put holes in the boat. If, if I'm gonna have to do that, then I want it to be on my terms. Second reason, uh, you can't really expand a Yak power system, at least not that I'm aware of. When I build out this box, I, I have the ability to add a switch. If I need more connectivity, I can just add to my distribution plate and it's not gonna cause any problems. Number three, you can't fix the Yak power system by yourself. It's, it's a pretty intense little piece of kit where everything is compact and together. If I need to fix a switch, if something simple breaks, then I want the ability to go out there and spend $5 to get a replacement component and salvage my own gear. I don't want to be beholden to somebody else's warranty and I don't want to have to wait forever for replacement parts to come in. Number four, as far as I can tell, the Yak power system doesn't give me a voltage readout. The Yak power system also doesn't have its own USB ports on it that I can plug into from the main distribution point because it's a relayed system. I will have a voltage readout that tells me how my accessory battery is doing at all times. I will also have the ability to recharge uh, electronic devices directly from the panel where I'm sitting. So I guess I kind of gave reason number five as well, which was the USB, but whatever. Five decent reasons right there why it makes sense to build your own solution if it's a thing you have the means to do. So it's what I'm gonna do. Total cost for all of the various components that I'm gonna be using here fall somewhere in the neighborhood of $120. Things are expensive right now. That's just all there is to it. Yak power systems usually run for, I wanna say 89 or $90. The way I see it, I'm spending a little bit more than what the most basis baseline system would get me. And I am spending uh, a little bit less than what a comparable high level system would get me. Links to everything I used in this project will be posted in the description below. As we do with all projects, we start out with a roughly scaled diagram. Once again, I'm using my graph paper. Here we have a box, waterproof, rated all the way up to, I wanna say IP65. What is IP65? It's basically a measurement of how waterproof and dustproof a containment system is, which is a pretty high level. You know, would I hit it with a pressure washer? Probably not, but if that's something that I'm doing, I'm wrong in the first place. So we have our scale diagrams. We lay our box roughly over this and it gives us pretty close one-to-one -one approximation of what we're gonna be dealing with. So let's go ahead and look at how this box actually comes from the factory. These are lightly screwed in. Okay, so right off the bat, we see that we have this rubber seal, which will fit into this channel around the box and that's what actually waterproofs this rust. Now when you're pressing these in, these are designed so that the seal uh, is actually longer than what you need for the box. It's incumbent upon you, uh, the person using the box, to fill in this channel properly. Again, you're looking for downward pressure. You're not looking to stretch it. You're not looking to like squeeze it in. It should go in super easily. You know, make sure you're going around these bends the right way. And then once you get to the end, 
you have to cut it off so that it marries up with that other piece of grommet or the other end of the grommet. So let's go ahead and do that now. And once that's done, it's always a good idea to hit that with a little bit of glue. Now I read the measurements off of Amazon before I made these purchases and let's just say that these are not what I thought they would be. Because when we compare the size of these buses to what Amazon's measurements told me they would be, um, I guess this part is right, but this part is not. Now that's not going to screw us up because we had plenty of room in here, but it does make things a little bit tighter. Let's count them out now. So we need one, two, three, four, five buses. One. All right, so we've discussed what happens off the bus. So once once the positive gets down here to this bus, then that same 12 volts that's coming from the battery is now able to be distributed throughout the switching box uh, really, really easily. These are waterproof 12 volt, 20 amp rated switches. 20 amps is way more than I'm ever gonna need. Um, I think most of the draw that I'm gonna be dealing with here, the biggest draw item that I'm going to have is likely the graph and everything that I'm reading tells me that that graph is at most one amp. Actually, come to think of it, the biggest draw that I'm going to have is probably the USB because that is a QC 3.0. These are rapid chargers. So, not really sure how much current this is going to draw, but this is going to be fused, just in case. The rest of it, I'm really not so much worried about. There is a 20 amp fuse built into the battery pack. My composite amount of power draw going to that that 20 amp hour battery is more than 20 amps it will break inside of here so we're going to use the same switches throughout this project these are three connector switches one leg that is your ground and then you've got two legs that are your positive uh, one is positive power coming in and you get an open when the switch is in the open position and then when you close it it supplies power to the second leg. So one is coming from the battery, the other one is going to your load. If you're drawing this out, it's always a good idea to draw dots representing the, the, the way your switch is gonna be wired. So you kind of have these easy connect the dots things so you can roadmap exactly what you're gonna do. If you get these identical switches, the two silver leads are the positive, the switch positive, and then this is a body ground. Now, why would it need this body ground? These are LED switches. So these are gonna light up for me when they're active and in use. Pretty cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my fancy caliber to get a read. This is a pinch side connector. So the idea is that once you get this on, these little clips on the side, apply pressure up against the wall of uh, whatever it is that you're connecting them to. So I'm gonna set my caliper for 7 8 because that's a common drill bit size and we're gonna confirm that 7 8 will do the trick. So 7 8 is plenty of room this to go on. So when it comes time to drill these holes, we're going to use a specialized drill bit called the stepping bit. This one maxes out at 7 eighths of an inch and we can see how it has these different layers. So let's see, 13 16 is about where I want to stop. So if I drill to the point where I get onto this last ring, I've gone too far. So I want to drill all the way up to right here and then I'm going to stop. Okay, so that's our first one in. Let's make sure that everything is done correctly. Perfect. It's exactly right. 13 sixteenths was 100% the way to go. And the nice thing about these is I can now pinch the sides and take this out. Now, these are IP68, I want to say, rated switches. Um, they do have this small rubber seal that runs along the outside edge. Uh, I will likely go ahead and put silicone on these anyway, from the back where you can't see it.
do we want the voltage meter to sit on the top? Here's where it's going to sit right here. Some things to worry about. Gravity. Water, when it comes in, is going to come in from the top. This has a cover. This is rated pretty well. I forget which IP rating it is. The question is, do I trust it? No matter which way you do it, there's risk. We're going to go to the top. I will take that all day long. Slow and steady wins the race. This test fitted. Look at that. Bang. All right, we can go ahead and start getting our soldered line connections together. As we talked about before, the copper colored leads are the negative and the silver leads are the positive. Now we could use quick connects for this, um, but what I'm going to do instead is solder. It's more reliable. All we have to do here is strip off the leads and then wire them directly into the lugs. It really doesn't matter where you position them. What matters is that the negatives go to the negative side and the positives go to the positive side. I need a jumper to go across each one of these. And all a jumper is, is it, it connects this bus to this bus to this bus. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, it can go in piggyback on top of something else. Now these glands have a washer here, they have a plastic nut here, right? And then they have the shank that comes out and then there, there is this that goes over them. And as you tighten, I don't know how well you can see daylight through this, but if you tighten this, it closes around whatever cable you have fitting through here. So it's important that whatever connector you get, you make sure you get the right size. Okay, that is an issue. So we're hitting our bus on this one. That is unfortunate. It's okay though. It's a mistake. And mistakes are alright. As long as you can fix them. We're not going to worry too much about where these leads are going to go because we don't want to wire things into these switches until we're out there, like at the kayak. And with power coming in this one side, we can run it to the main and we can find out if these other switches are getting power. And then we can, uh, just as a quick test, check to see if this USB lights up and lets us charge. So do you remember when I talked about I was going to need a hole in the hole no matter what I did, right? Uh, you know what? I take that back. I think I may have just figured out exactly how I'm going to do this. There's no reason for me to have to go through the hull at all. This uses trolling motor connector ports. And I want these to be 
interchangeable. So if the trolling motor battery dies, the 100 amp hour, then at least I can swap back to the to the 20 amp hour battery in a pinch, or vice versa, right? Having common connectors is, is really a key to this entire build. And the thing that I've been thinking about is, oh, well, I gotta go through the hole in order to get to this box. No, I don't. There's no reason for me to drill a hole. Can I come into here and secure myself to the side of the box without damaging anything? I don't know. We're gonna try. I can do this. Okay, so we're gonna follow our same line. Success. Didn't ruin anything. Put this to go in. Doesn't interfere with anything. Yep. That's gonna work. Next thing we've got to do is figure out which one of these two leads is the positive. We can do that again with our simple continuity test. So plug this into the trolling motor. Let's go with, let's go with this one. All right, we'll go to our bus. All right, we got zero. Good. Other bus. We got zero, so the bus is working going across here. All of these should now effectively be hot because they're all tied in. Bang, we're at zero, so that's working. That works. Good. Good. Let's check our negatives as well. Make sure the bus is working the way it's supposed to. Good. Good. When we actually do go to run a wire to power a system off of this, you're going to have a red and a black that comes in through these holes. The red is going to go to the back of this switch, and the black is going to go down here to this bus. We are going to take our specially built cable. Oops. We are going to take our specially built cable and we are going to plug it into our power supply. And fingers crossed, our USB reader or our, our USB charger will be functional. Let's check and see if each of these lights work. <sighs> we are good to go. <laughs> I need to replace this. But, you guys see, in principle, it works. We are at the point now where we are ready to install the navigation lights. And here's the starboard side. So this is the side that's going to have the green light. You can see that I have masked it off so we can make marks on the hull without causing too much damage. I want these to be as far forward as I can possibly get them. Let's look at the back of this. We can see how big our drill bit needs to be. We were looking at about 7 16 just to get it done. Okay, so now we're gonna feed our lines through and this is not gonna be so we can wire it just yet. This is just to make sure that our marks are correct.
we are going to be doing aluminum rivets to secure the lights to the side of the gunnel. Um, of course, the benefit of using aluminum here is that it doesn't corrode. Make sure that they're long rivets so that we can get them all the way through the hull before we compress them. Good. Good. Here's the part that can be a challenge. We're gonna take this open hatch, right? And we're gonna use that to insert this metal nut. It doesn't really matter what the nut is made out of. All that matters is that it's magnetic. And then we are going to run this neodymium magnet, fishing magnet, um, along the outside of the hull. And we are going to use this string that's attached to it to fish our wire. Give you some idea of the strength here. Bang. I want to say this one is rated for 550 pounds. <laughs> so more than enough. All right, we got a good hook up there. You should be able to see this line feeding through as I was walking in this direction. Now that we are over here to this portion of the boat, we can see the magnet is still securely attached to the hull. But I can reach into the hull and grab a hold of that nut and my line is fished. Again, I want to say this is 14 gauge wire. We take the spare end of the string and we are going to tie it off. That's plenty secure. We can feed this down into the hole. Now that's in the hull, back down this way to grab our string. And we should see it feeding through from the other side. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're going to pull ourselves out a few feet because that's what we're going to need. Cut it off at the other side. I'm giving myself about, eh, let's call it four feet. <laughs> now the trick for the navigation lights there's two of them. So we're going to have to split this out so that it runs to both lights. We're going to do that with butt connectors. If that falls back down into the hull, it's not the end of the world. But we want plenty of slack because you never know. And this is going to get fed through here. All right. There's the first one, right? Now we do the same thing on the opposite side of the hole.
So when it comes to the location where the distribution box lives, it's underneath the seat. You can see there's plenty of clearance there. No issues at all. And the place where we're going to end up putting our access points is right through here. So we're going to drill a series of three holes, one for the graph, one for the nav lights, and one for the footlights. All right, so once again, these are going to be one half inch holes. It's working. All right, first one's on. Hey, look at that. Much easier. Those are about as snug as they need to be. And now we feed our line through. Okay. We slide this compression nut back over it. All right, nice and snug, good to go. So we're gonna go ahead and leave this slack. We're gonna do the wiring for the graph. These are the holes that come stock in the AP-136 with these cool little guards. I'm going to go ahead and pull these up. And this is going to be for the graph. So we're just going to go ahead and push this through. Okay, so graph and transducer. Those are good to go. Gonna need to do the same trick we did before, but because this hole is smaller, I'm gonna use a smaller magnetic item. Where'd the magnet go? This one will work just, just fine. Already connected. <laughs> Feed this on back through. And I believe these are the only two we're gonna do tonight because I think I need more wire. Okay, time for the moment of truth. Voltage is applied. Reading 13.4 volts off the accessory battery. Voltage is applied. The graph is functioning. And the lamp lights are. So, whenever you're riding, there's plenty of room. Doesn't get in the way of anything. This one's going to be a spare. This one is going to be for my footwell lights, which I haven't installed yet. And for these glands, you can see on the side here. If you want to block those off, so they continue to be watertight. 
all you have to do is cut off a chunk of wire and flush mount it to the edge. Make sure it doesn't touch anything on the inside and you're good to go. But that one's ready for whenever nav lights are here. Haven't decided which ones I'm putting in or where I'm putting them yet, but the build is coming right along. Well, friends and family, that's probably going to do it for tonight's episode. I'm pretty stoked to be where we are right now. We have the DIY power battery box. We have the DIY power distribution system. We have the nav lights installed. We have the up and running fish finder. Everything's really coming together. The only thing that's really left for me to do to make this my absolute dream kayak is uh, installation of the footwell lights and everything for that's on order. Check it out if you happen to live in the Washington DC area, Northern Virginia, Legion of Anglers is gonna be hosting a cleanup event. Information about it is gonna be contained within the description below. Check it out, show up, meet the Legion, hang out, take care of the water that we all care about. And then afterwards, maybe catch a couple fish. Like I said, that's gonna do it for tonight's episode. Remember, it's never too late to care again. <laughs>